Congressman Ro Khanna represents California's 17th Congressional District, which is located here in the heart of Silicon Valley. He is serving his first term in the United States Congress. And I want to note for the audience, he's helping to lead uh, the fight to hold or to change uh, U.S. support for, for atrocities that are happening around the world related to uh, arms and things uh, like that in Yemen. His commitment to public service uh, was inspired by his grandfather, who was active in Gandhi's independence movement who, and worked with Lala Lajpat Rai in India and spent several years in jail fighting for independence. And prior to being a congressman, he served in President Obama's administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Department of Cong Commerce. Please invite him up with a loud round of applause. the leading uh, journalist on so many issues of foreign policy uh, in Washington, and it's an honor to have you here. And I'm to be here. Thank you for your continued leadership uh, for our community, your friendship, the vice mayor, Captain Watanabe, and the other uh, distinguished speakers. I was uh, reflecting on Dr. King about my grandfather, because as everyone knows, he went to India and uh, was inspired by Gandhi's movement of nonviolence, which led in part to the civil rights movement. And of course, we had so many of the debates that are now taking place back in the 1960s. I uh, read about Senator Sam Irwin, a conservative Democrat, in 1964 or 65, who said that Ethiopians made no contribution to America. And I thought to myself, the problem with our current president is not just that he's morally wrong, but that he's unoriginal. <laughs> and he's parroting arguments made in the 1960s, early 1960s, when 85% of Republicans voted for the Immigration Reform Act that allowed my parents to come to this country that allowed so many people probably in this room and their ancestors and their uh, parents, their grandparents to come to this country. And the argument then, you know, all of this argument about chain migration, the argument then was actually made for family reunification to appease people like Sam Irwin because they said, you know, if we let folks who are already here have their parents and their brothers and their siblings come to the United States, we may not change too much the demographic composition of the United States. <laughs> that was the argument. Family reunification was a policy that was supposed to mitigate the impact of the Immigration Reform Act. And now, of course, when so many people from all parts of the world have come to the United States, contributed to the United States, and are now settled and thinking about bringing their parents or their families the very party of family values, and some of the same people who fought for family reunification in the 1960s are labeling it chain migration. Because the people they thought would be 
candidates to have families here are not the ones who now are benefiting from having families here. And so you think about what's unique about our president, because this country, as Father Hurley and others have alluded to, we've always had an issue of moving backwards or forwards in our history. When Benjamin Franklin had talked about how the Germans may not be great Americans, and you know, our vice mayors talked about the discrimination against the Irish at one point. And I know your grandfather uh, fought for independence in Ireland. And we've had discrimination against Jews and Italians and people from Southern Europe. But I don't think we've ever had, or at least I can't think, of a leader who has, after a debate has been settled and won, wanted to actually move us backwards. The history of this country usually is that there is some form of discrimination, some form of non-acceptance. We fight hard. We reach a consensus. We make our union a little bit more perfect. We acknowledge that we had blind spots. And then we move forward. But Trump wants to relitigate issues which we thought were long in the past. And I think that's what upsets so many people at such a deep level. It's not just that he <laughs> is trying to prevent progress. It's that he is challenging the very American notion of progress in a more perfect union. The notion that Dr. King had that the arc of justice bends, the arc of history bends towards justice, that we continue to fight and uh, work towards a more perfect union. The faith, you know, I had a conversation with someone thing that really struck me in it about with a baby boomer generation of feminists. And she said, she was 65 years old, and she said, my whole life, I thought ours was the generation that was fighting for women's rights and women equality, women's equality. And our generation elected the most misogynistic president in recent history, in novel history. And so the president would challenges the conception of history moving towards a more just society challenges the American conception that we are bound to become a more inclusive, a more multicultural society, a more just society. But my, like the other speakers, I retain a fundamental optimism. And people say, well, how are you optimistic? And my optimism stems from the district that I represent, and young folks in this district, where they are totally, perhaps somewhat ignorant of history, but also unencumbered by history. And you have, you know, young, Pakistani American, Indian Americans, totally unaware of the conflicts, working together, Jews, Palestinians, folks for fourth generation Santa Clarans, working side by side with the kids of new immigrants. I mean, that generation, which I believe is the future of this country. They're certainly creating the most wealth Apple, Google, Intel, they're driving the economy. They represent what America is going to be, what America is capable of being. And I ultimately believe that what we're trying to do in this country is so difficult. 
And the reason it's so difficult is I don't think it's ever done, been done before. I don't think you have had a universal nation conceived of philosophical ideals, devoid of cultural heritage or relations based on blood. That was the radical premise of our founding. You know, that's Lincoln's Gettysburg Address came forth to conceive a new nation. A total rejection that nations are founded based on language or religion or culture. And for 200 some years, it was a tough experiment, but it was an experiment largely with a nation that was Christian and a largely a nation that was Caucasian. And now, suddenly, it's been put to the test. Because post-1965, the nation has become the world. And the question is, are we capable of being a nation conceived on philosophical principles and not rooted in culture, not rooted in religion? If it were easy, it would have been done before in history. If it were easy to have a sense where everyone can be American based on an indifference to national origin or religion, there would be some other society that would have achieved it. So it is something that is worth fighting for. It's something that ought to be earned. But when we do achieve it, and I think this next generation certainly will, it will be by far America's great contribution to human history and human civilization, to be a universal nation that actually lives up to its creed. My, let me end with this. People say, what is the best way to contrast with the president? And I often say, I think that the greatest put down that you can make to someone in this country is not to say that they have biased views on race or biased views on gender or biased views about identity. The greatest put down, in my view, for an American is to label them part of the past. We are a nation that broke from the past. We hate the past. We broke from the old world. We all left the old world. We came to America, we're a culture obsessed with youth, obsessed with gadgets, obsessed with technology, obsessed about the future. The worst thing you can say to someone is that you're part of, the, part of the path. Well, Trump, by his own admission, is part of the past. That's what he wants to do. He wants to take us back to the past. And while he may win temporarily, I'm confident in the long run, People will always pick the future. And this district is far more the future of America than our president ever will be. So thank you for inviting me.